milk expansion in the region. I'm Mike Allen. I'm a professor in the Fisheries Aquatic Sciences Program at UF and director of the Nature Coast Biological Station. And uh, thanks to Savannah and Emily Colson for organizing these events. Um, I think it's, a, it's great to get to learn about the science going on at the, in the region. Um, I'm going to turn my video off just in the name of bandwidth, um, so, but you'll be able to, to hear me. Um, so we're going to start talking about SNOOP, and I want to first acknowledge our collaborator, uh, Caleb Pertabaugh, and his entire lab at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission lab in Cedar Key. We've been working on this project for about five years with them, hand in hand, um, together with their group. And so I want to be sure and acknowledge them. And also Charlie Martin. Charlie's on the, on the call here. I'll also mention Ashley McDonald. She's with our group, and she is also heavily involved in the snook work, particularly some of the future snook work that we have uh, planned as well. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this is some water temperature data that Charlie put together actually from the Cedar Key uh, dock out front. It's the NOAA gauge station in, in Cedar Key. And the point of this, and, and I'm not going to use a lot of graphs, I'm also not going to talk a long time because I want to leave time for discussion. But our winters are getting warmer um, and summers are getting hotter. We've got more warm days every year and less cold days every year. There's obviously exceptions to that and there will continue to be. 2010 was a particularly cold year. Um, but in general, our, our water temperatures are increasing in the region and, and that, that increase is very evident over the last 20 to 25 years. Um, and that those changes are causing a lot of changes in the ecosystem. And today we're talking about snook, but the, the, the results here are not just for snook. It's, it's a lot of species range changes are, are expanding northward. The snook is of primary interest because it's a very popular sport fish. Uh, it's a predator uh, native to Florida. Um, it's a protan, what we call a protandrous hermaphrodite. They actually, all of them are born males. And then some of them switch to females. They don't all switch to females, but most of them switch to females in their life. They start switching sexes about in the 18 to 22 inch size. Um, but again, some will stay males throughout their life. Um, probably the sex switching is, is complex social interactions. It is for most hermaphroditic fishes. Um, but if you catch a large snook, it's most likely a female, but it had changed sex from a male. Um, snook are a warm, a warm water uh, fish. They're, they're not tolerant of cold temperatures at all. Water temperatures below about 10 degrees Celsius, which is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, cause a lot of loss of equilibrium and mortality. And so uh, winter cold kills of snook are not uncommon in Florida. The 2010 uh, cold kill killed snook all the way down through the Everglades. Those kind of events will happen again. And that's part of the, the impetus for this talk and some of the work we have ongoing. But the snook population really, this is a very this large a snook. I actually had some video, some audio in that slide, um, but a, a large trophy snook you can see here. That's from the uh, Cedar Key area, uh, Bill Gare from UF um, with a really large, most likely female. Um, and we started getting reports from fishermen and people cast netting for mullet, for bait, about 10 years ago, really, we started commonly hearing about snook. And the odd angler would catch a few. We'd have a few catch of hook and line, but we started hearing about them in cast nets. And it's just become more and more common. And we're really fortunate that we have the Florida Fish and Wildlife Fisheries Independent Monitoring Program ongoing in Sea or Key over the past 24 years. And so they have long-term data that they collect every single month. And so we're really able to look at those data to look at the expansion of snook in our area. And I'll show you some of those and then leave time for questions. You can see that early on, prior to about 2007, there were almost no snook collected. And this is all the thing that FWC does in Cedar Key. So this is 12 sample days a month over the past 24 years. Um, and you can see that snook were extremely rare, almost no catches prior to 2005. Um, and then a few in 2010, and then starting about 2013, we started seeing snook really commonly caught. 
And that expansion has just gone exponential at this point. And snook are super common. They're caught every month during the warm winter month or warm summer months in Cedar Key. And so they're very common. It's an exponential population growth rate that we've seen in this region. This, these maps show the expansion of snook in the region through time. The upper left one is just a single snook, that's a little tiny black dot caught in the, near the Channel Islands near North Key. And then you can see the, to the panel to the immediate right in 2007 to 2011, we started commonly seeing a few snook and the size of these dots represents how many fish were collected. 2012 to 2015, they were collected throughout Cedar Key and also further north. And then in the last few years, they're caught throughout the Suwannee Estuary, north of the Suwannee River, definitely in the Suwannee River and throughout the Cedar Key area. And so the expansion of snook in this area has really taken a hold and, and, uh, and we consider them now fully established in the area. This is, uh, you know, historically there would be an odd snook caught here and there in, in the Cedar Key area. Um, but nothing like what we've seen now where we have all sizes of snook distributed throughout the area every year. One of the points, and on the, on the x-axis here we have uh, length of snook, and these are large fish that are say 25 to, 20 to 30 inches long in this size here. This is in millimeters, but these would be large fish. So the point of this is that early in the invasion there was only really large snook that came in. And in the recent years, as 2018 and continuing today, it's all sizes of snook. We see all, we see local reproduction. Uh, we see lots of juvenile fish. We see lots of intermediate size and we still see the large adult breeding size snook as well in the Cedar Key area. So we just published a paper on this that, that we believe this really is evidence that the snook are now fully established and that there is a range shift that goes what was historically the range was about Tarpon Springs and maybe a little bit north of that. And now we postulate that the, the snook have expanded their, their endemic range to north of the Suwannee River. There's also some reports of snook as far north as Apalachicola, Keaton Beach, even snook up in Alabama. And again, the odd adult individual may be collected here and there, but not like what we've seen in the Suwannee Basin where it's all sizes of snook, juveniles, adults, local reproduction. And that's why we argue that they're fully established now in this region. This is uh, Caleb and, uh, and Johnny and Brian Klimek, some of the FWC staff actually inputting a, a acoustic uh, transmitter into a snook. And we're doing a lot of this tracking their movements and future uh, presentations. We'll talk specifically about the fish movements uh, in here. And I'll skip ahead here, but the mangroves are also expanding. Anyone that's been in our part of the coast knows that the mangroves have expanded substantially along with tropicalization of other species. It's not just snook. We've also seen things like the odd parrotfish and, and other tropical species that are moving northward through the Gulf and up the Atlantic coast as well. So I'll stop there. I want to thank our collaborators. Um, I will also mention that the Suwannee River Water Management District is working with us now as well as the Florida FWC to look at snook as a possible indicator for minimum flows and levels. Um, the groundwater and spring discharge in the lower Suwannee could be very important thermal refuge for these animals during winter. And so we're trying to look at that with the water management district as a partner. So um, I think I'll open it up because we really wanted to leave time for questions. And so um, we'll have time for discussion and I can add some more uh, inside as we go. And Charlie, also feel free to weigh in here. So I'll open it up to questions. Great. Thanks so much, Mike, for that and running us through the work. And I'll just go ahead and let everyone know you can either type your question in the chat or you can unmute your mic and ask our panel questions directly. And it looks like we've got a question incoming from Justin. So we'll give him a minute to finish typing. Okay, sure. I will mention while we're here that, you know, it, it, it seems, well, let's go ahead and get Justin's question. This is Tracy. Yes. So what is their tolerance for fresh water and how long can they survive in the Suwannee without having to return to the estuary? That's a really good question, Tracy. And we've learned a lot about that in the last 10 to 15 years in Florida. 
Um, the adult snook, they need, they need salt, not, not pure salt water, but estuarine conditions to actually reproduce for the, for the development of the eggs and larvae. But the adults can tolerate fresh water indefinitely. And what we've learned through a lot of telemetry work around the state is that some of the adult snook will spend their whole year in fresh water and actually never go to the coast. Um, and we've collected snook in the Suwannee River right in the middle of the summer when you might expect them to be in the coast. We've collected them in fresh water. So the adults are happy to be in fresh water. They forage there effectively and they do fine, but they do need the estuarine environment for reproduction. So good question. Great. Um, and the, the next question is from Corinne. And how have the increased snook populations affected other species either negatively or positively? That's another great question, Corinne. And it's one that we are keenly interested in going forward in the future. I'll give you one example. In 2010, when there was a cold kill throughout the, all the way, killed the snook all the way down through the Everglades. When that happened, uh, Dr. Jennifer Rehaj at FI you and her colleagues were working on snook down there and what they documented was that when the snook died due to the cold temperatures down there the redfish really rebounded and the red drum actually abundance went up and so and there's a lot of diet overlap between snook and other native sport fish like spotted sea trout and red drum so we expect there to be competitive interactions now that snook are in this system and it, and that the abund the increase in snook could come at a cost to some of the other predators, at least to some degree. And that is something that we're keenly interested in. And we have some diet work planned as well as some trophic dynamic modeling that Dr. Dave Shigaris is doing specifically to look at what effects of the food web might be of these expanding snook populations. So excellent question. All right, great. And Justin's question is in now and it is aside from increasing sea surface temperature and favorable mangrove habitat, do you have any other ideas about driving factors on why adult snook are migrating beyond those current ranges? Excellent. Another, another question. You know, and I don't know, the, the um, you know, the expansion of mangroves in our region, black mangroves have been coming in since for the last 25 years, really preceding the snook. Um, but I don't know that based on where we're seeing snook collected, I don't believe that the snook are here because the mangroves have invaded. I, I think the snook are taking advantage of a, a better thermal environment, winters that aren't as harsh, and add a lot of food in this region. Um, Charlie's estuarine ecology presentation just a bit ago showed that the Cedar Key area has abundant prey relative to some other estuaries in the Gulf of Mexico. And I think there's just a lot of food for them. And, that if they can survive the winter, there's just a lot of forage and, and good habitat for them. But we do see them around mangroves, but also we see snook on oyster bars and salt marsh that are the historic habitat in our region even before mangroves showed up. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting question, but I think it's mainly just food. Um, the other point I'll make though, is that the Suwannee River does provide some potential for thermal refuge. And that's something we're keenly interested in is that the groundwater and the freshwater in the river may provide protection where the snook can go there in the winter and over winter. And that's something that we're looking at with the telemetry and tracking of fish. Awesome. Um, so another question from Tracy and she asks, has, has FEM data shown a decrease in competitors like redfish or trout since 2003? Uh, great question, Tracy. There are, the trout data actually had shown some modest declines. I think that I would be hesitant to say that those are due to snook. Um, the, the most recent stock assessment for spotted sea trout also indicated pretty high fishing mortality rates and the FWC actually changed the size limit on trout this year in response um, to try to improve the status of the stock for spotted sea trout. Um, I can say for both redfish and spotted sea trout, it's not like we're seeing large declines in either of those species now that snook are here. But with the snook being fully established now, you know, over the next decade, it's going to be interesting to watch how those species may be affected by snook. And the, the M data set from FWC gives us a, a great tool to be able to do that. But so far, I would say we haven't seen uh, large declines um, due to snook. Excellent. Um, 
So another question, a clarifying question about if these are just common snook or if the data is an aggr aggregate of multiple species of snook. Oh, good question, Cameron. And, and, and so far, the species detected in Cedar Key are common snook. There's six or seven total snook species. We haven't seen some of the other species here, but it is a, it is a, a, a good question and one that we'll be on the lookout for. We've talked to the FWC about that as well, but common snook are all that's been collected in the Cedar Key area so far. Um, I will mention that we had a graduate student with the FWC that did a genetic analysis of the snook in this expanding range. Her name was Emma Pistol. And she actually showed that the genetic composition of the common snook in the Cedar Key area are distinct from the Tampa region, which would mean that probably the snook population in the Suwannee estuary was established by a relatively low number of individuals that had some unique genetic composition. And so they are different genetically, the same species, but different genetically from Tampa Bay. But we will be on the lookout for some of the other um, uh, snook species as well, like fat snook and uh, Mexicana and those kind of things. So. Okay, great. And in answering that question, you also answered the next question that came in about mm -hmm. genetic diversity in this population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and from Dave, and that, that and that was an important one to look at. And it, it does turn out that there's less genetic diversity in the Cedar Key snook population, at least today. Than there was than there is in Tampa Bay, and probably that's what we call a founder effect, where the population and the northern extent of the range has been started by a low number of individuals that just by by lottery chance have a low lower genetic diversity. So it'll be interesting to see how that changes through time. Great, awesome. So you had a couple more come in. Homosassa River Spring service thermal refuge for snook there's significantly more in the winter season than in summer we don't really see the same pattern as definitively in chaza witzka or kings bay any ideas that's an interesting one i mean i think that all those springs and maybe in the very head spring you don't notice them as much in chaza witzka or kings bay but i think that it would be fair to say that all the springs in the nature coast including the springs in the swanee river have higher snook abundance in the winter. Um, but the Homosassa is a really evident case which has that huge aggregation at the spring, at the spring vent. So I think that the, there is an aggregation that goes on in the springs um, throughout the region. It's not just there, but, but it is, I think, most evident in Homosassa. So that winter thermal refuge is really a critical question that, that we're interested in because we will get winters that are going to cause the water temperatures to go below the thermal tolerance for snook and, and having access to the groundwater and the thermal refuge is going to be important for them to persist in this region just like it is for manatees and and other warm water animals that that they can't stand cold temperatures all right great and um there was a couple mentions of the 2010 cold kill which you addressed already Mm -hmm. And then also Corinne is asking for links that we could share. And Charlie, thank you for yeah, thank you, Charlie. Sending that, that over. Yeah, that's so. I have a that's question, great. Michael. We're waiting for others to chime in. Um, when was the first snook that you caught in this range expansion area? Do you remember? Mine was the first snook. I it took me a while to catch one, but the first one I caught was three or four years ago. Um, and it's been interesting to watch for me because the FWC has been collecting snook regularly for the last six or seven years. I mean, every, you know, every single month in the summer they catch them. Um, but it seems to me that it's really only in the last two to three years that the catches by anglers have really expanded. And I, I think anglers have started to kind of figure out the habitats these things live in. And also the snook abundance has reached a point where they're just really commonly caught. A lot of the fishing guides are catching them in the same locations they catch red drum around oyster bars and that kind of thing. Um, I just saw Holden's question, which, which I'm glad you asked that Holden about are there historic reports or records of snook previously um, in this region? And I have not been able to find um, historic reports. And we actually looked at some uh, otolith data 
um, that has been looked at in, in Native American middens, olothar ear bones on fish, to try to find evidence for snook being in middens for, of Native Americans. We haven't found any. Now, it could be that the detection, being able to detect those is really uh, low, and we can't say for sure that there weren't snook um, then. Um, I have talked to some of the locals uh, in Cedar Key. Heath Davis is one that's had five generations of his family, and they were commercial fishermen for years and years. And, and he said that the first snook that Heath ever saw was in 1997, and that was this, also the first one that his father had ever seen. Um, so I think that the, the majority of the evidence would suggest that this invasion over the last decade is truly new um, and has not happened before. And the other thing I'll mention is that I feel like if the snook had ever gotten established in this region the way they are now, um, that they probably wouldn't be extirpated by a bad winter, a cold winter, because of thermal refuge spring vents in the lower Suwannee would allow a lot of them to survive, even the coldest winter. So I, I do believe that what we're seeing here is a truly a new invasion of a native fish that's expanded its range. Uh, northward. And one of the terms people are using for that is called a neo-native. It's a native fish, but it's new to this area. So excellent, excellent questions. Yeah. Those are right on the forefront of what we're trying to understand. Yeah, so an, an interstate question. So Georgia anglers are catching a higher number on the Atlantic coast in the past several years. Um, so have you uh, heard about or seen a similar range expansion on the east coast? We have. Um, we have heard of a big expansion that's going on from St. Augustine northward all the way through Jacksonville and into Georgia and up into South Carolina as well. So the same expansion of both mangroves and snook is going on on both coasts. I'll also mention here that we've there's a recent paper that came out that's documenting the same expansion for snook in Texas as well, that they're moving further north, as far north as being common in Galveston now, which historically they were never there except for the very southern part of Texas along the Mexico border. So this expansion is happening on the East Coast and throughout the Gulf of Mexico. Interesting. So a um, question from Jordan about uh, FWC electrofishing had 358 snook out of the Chaz in 2017, but that was a lot higher than the average of other years of about 60. So what could have caused that big bump that for that year? I don't, you know, I'm not sure, Jordan. I, I don't. Um, in 2017, depending on when that was, that was a cold, relatively cold winter. We had some minor fish kills in the winter of 2017 and 2018. So I don't know if it's a temperature effect, that it, but I will say that when we do get a really strong cold snap, it attracts snook into these spring runs and they go from the mouths to, to up into the springs to, to seek that warm water. But I can't say for sure if that's what caused that change at the Chazowitzka. Great. So um, a question about what the likelihood of them continuing to move northward past Keaton and establish a reproducing population in the Big Bend, like in St. Mark's, where there are other um, springs that can serve as thermal refuges. Great, Stephen. I, I, and I think that's likely. I think that, you know, we're documenting a, a range expansion here, but it's going to continue. Um, mangroves are continuing to move north. And I think that that northward migration will continue. Now, I will say that the groundwater springs are probably the key to the persistence because when we do get that cold winter, it will set them back and, and kill snook um, in, in those areas unless there's thermal refuge for them to be able to hide. And, and they may be able to hide either by moving offshore or moving inshore to some groundwater vents and springs and that kind of thing. Um, but I do expect this expansion to keep heading northward. Okay, great. And um, uh, well, another question, are they also in the other hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, are they expanders, expanding southward? You know, Holden, I don't know. That's a good question. And I don't know if they're expanding um, southward. They go down into the southern hemisphere, yes. Um, but I don't know if there's a southward expansion. It's not, not if there is, but we're looking at the question. All right. Well, um, we still have a 
couple of minutes left, but I am going to go ahead and launch a poll so that you can give us a little bit of feedback about the presentation. But if anyone has a last burning question or two, we do have about three minutes left to address those. So feel free to keep sending those in and then also take a moment to fill out the poll. Um, okay, so do you think the expansion is linked solely to climate change? Um, I mean, I think that the, the lack of the cold winters that regularly uh, sets them back is the main driver for this expansion. But I also think that there's just a lot of food up in this area that is, you know, it's prime habitat except for the thermal uh, limits on the winter. And so when those have been relaxed, snook are free to move into the region. Um, so I, I think that's the driving, the driving factor there. Other questions? I'll just mention, you know, snook are really well managed. The, um, the, they have a narrow harbor a slot limit and a closed and open season, um, and uh, and they're well managed. The snook is up, they're open for harvesting right now. I believe it's 28 to 32 inch. It might be 33 inch. I have to check that um, slot limit on snook. But um, anglers can harvest them um, now as of early September. Um, so just check the local regulations. But it is possible to harvest a, a snook if it's in that slot size. All right, great. Well, that brings us to the end of our scheduled session. And I just wanted to remind everybody that we do have two more weeks of Nature Coast Currents. So um, next week at the same time from 4 to 4.30 and then again from 4.30 to 5, we are going to have two more presentations for you. Um, so please join us next week if you can. And thank you, everybody, for your time this afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Thank you.